The following message was recorded at an event hosted by Desiring God. More information about Desiring God events, conferences, and resources is available at www.desiringgod.org. As I'm getting started, I want to point out the bibliography up here. The, they're in alphabetical order, but right at the top is the very first book that I read, the first biography of Sarah Edwards, Marriage to a Difficult Man. Um, this has been out of print for quite a few years, and we uh, owe a big thanks to Jerry Marcelino and Audubon Press for staying with it until they got all the permissions they needed to to get this republished now. So if you don't have this, I hope you'll pick it up. It's a good way to start reading about Sarah. We're interested in Jonathan Edwards because of the influence he's had in our lives and in the way that we see God. And so that makes us curious about his wife. But I think we'd just be wasting our time here today if all we were doing is letting me tell you little interesting stories from her life. What I want and what I'm praying for, in fact, I'd like to stop right now and pray again that God would make this a biblical eye-opening time for us. Father, I pray that you would take the parts of her story that apply to my life, to each other life here, connect yourself to us through what we hear in Sarah's life today. In Jesus' name, amen. Biography is very important. Uh, Hebrews is a book of the Bible that reminds us of that by giving us people's stories. I just want to read two verses from Hebrews, chapter 13, verses 7 and 8, to get us started here. And while I'm reading it, I want you to think about what we'll be hearing today, the story of a person who led us, who led out ahead of us in our faith. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Those words, remember, consider, imitate. We should never think that we can't be a saint like Sarah Edwards. She'd be the first one to tell you that she wasn't great, but she'd also be the first one to tell you that she had a great God. And look at the end of this verse. This is the same God we have, Jesus Christ who is the same yesterday and today and forever. And so I just want to echo my husband's words that you'll look for him as we're hearing Sarah's story today. For the sake of context, let's remember that Jonathan and Sarah's whole lives were lived in colonies of the New World. Colonies. This uh, 1776 map shows America as they knew it. There were 13 small British colonies hugging the Atlantic coast. And then beyond that, there was a vast western wilderness who stretched who knows how far. And then the colonists, we must remember, were British citizens. We think of Jonathan Edwards as an American. He lived here on the American continent, but he was a British citizen. Um, and the British citizens in these 13 little colonies were surrounded by the territories of other nations. Florida and Southwest were Spain's. The Louisiana Territory was France's. New England and the other colonies along the edge there were England's. The French, in particular, were eager to ally themselves with the Indians against the English. This was the backdrop of the Edwards life. So as we're hearing their story, we should see garrisons on hilltops and hear shots in the distance and feel the discomfort of soldiers billeting in our homes, imagining the shock and the terror of hearing of a massacre in a nearby settlement. This was the backdrop, more or less, through most of their life. In 1723, at age 19, Jonathan had already graduated from Yale and had been a pastor in New York for a year. He came back to New Haven to go to work as a tutor at Yale. Sarah Pierpont was in New Haven. It's likely that he had already met her before or at least knew of her and knew her because he would have gone to the church while he'd been a student at Yale, the church where her father was a pastor, so he would have seen her every Sunday. Now, on his return in 1723, he was 20 and she was 13. 
and it wasn't unusual for women to be married at the age of 16. As his work began during that school year, it seems likely that he was somewhat distracted. We know we have a book that has something special written in it. We just imagine the setting that he's trying to study his Greek, and instead what he can think about is Sarah. So on this front page of his book, we have what he was really thinking about. They say there is a young lady in New Haven who is loved of that great being who made and rules the world, and that there are certain seasons in which this great being, in some way or other invisible, comes to her and fills her mind with exceeding sweet delight, and that she hardly cares for anything except to meditate on him. You could not persuade her to do anything wrong or sinful if you would give her all the world, lest she should offend this great being. She is of a wonderful sweetness, calmness, and universal benevolence of mind, especially after this great God has manifested himself to her mind. She will sometimes go about from place to place, singing sweetly, and seems always to be full of joy and pleasure. She loves to be alone, walking in the fields and groves, and seems to have someone invisible always with her, conversing with her. All of the biographers mention the great contrast between the two of them. Sarah was from one of the most distinguished families in Connecticut. Her education had been the best that a woman got during those days. She was accomplished in all the social skills uh, for polite society. She was musical. Perhaps she knew how to play the lute. We do know that there was a shopping list during the year of their marriage that asked Jonathan to bring back a lute string. So that might have been for their wedding or it might have been for her personal use. But they enjoyed music. People who knew her talked about her beauty and her easy way of conversing with people. Samuel Hopkins, who knew her later, stressed her peculiar loveliness of expression, the combined result of goodness and intelligence. Jonathan, on the other hand, was introverted and shy. He was uneasy with small talk. He'd entered college at the age of 13 and had graduated valedictorian. He ate sparingly in an age full of groaning tables filled with food. He was not a drinker. He was tall and gangly and awkwardly different. He was not full of social graces. (laughs) He wrote in his journal, A virtue which I need in a higher degree is gentleness. Now think of gentleness there in the same way that we use it in the word gentleman, meaning uh, having appropriate social grace. He said, if I had more of an air of gentleness, I should be much mended. One thing they had in common was a love for music. In fact, um, Jonathan pictured, imagined music as the most perfect, nearly perfect way that people could communicate with each other. He said, the best, most beautiful and most perfect way that we have of expressing a sweet concord of mind to each other is by music. When I would form in my mind an idea of a society in the highest degree happy, I think of them as expressing their love, their joy, and the inward concord and harmony and spiritual beauty of their souls by sweetly singing to each other. And then, as he always did, he leapt from human realities to heavenly realities, seeing sweet human intimacy as just a little ditty compared to the symphony of heavenly intimacy with God. As she grew older and he grew somewhat more mellower, they began to spend more time together. They enjoyed walking and talking together, and they must have talked about some serious things. At some point, she introduced him to a book that he found influential in his thinking about the covenant as time passed. In 1725, in the spring, they were engaged. Jonathan was a man who bore uncertainties in thought and theology as if they were physical stress. So add to this these years of waiting for Sarah and the kind of stress that added to his life. Here are a few three days of his descriptions of himself from his journals. December 29, dull and lifeless. January 9, decayed. January 10, recovering. This is a year and a half before they'd be able to marry. And he was very serious about wanting to avoid sin. And so you find him trying to think of ways to turn his mind from thoughts that would lead where he doesn't want to go yet. He resolved, when I'm violently beset with temptation or cannot rid myself of evil thoughts, to do some sum in arithmetic or geometry or some other study. (laughs) This is serious. 
which necessarily engages all my thoughts and unavoidably keeps them from wandering. They were finally married on July 28, 1727. She was 17. He was 24. He wore a new powdered wig and a new set of white clerical bands that his sister Mary had made for him. And she wore a boldly patterned green satin brocade. We only get glimpses of the passion and love they had for each other in their marriage. And a lot of it comes through Jonathan's writing about marriage being a picture of Christ's love for his church. He wrote, when we have the idea of another's love to a thing, if it be the love of a man to a woman, we have not generally any further idea at all of his love. We only have an idea of his actions that are the effects of love. We have a faint, vanishing notion of their affections. In other words, you can tell the way someone treats a person lovingly, but that doesn't, that's just a hint of what's really inside. Jonathan had become the pastor in Northampton following in the footsteps of his grandfather, Solomon Stoddard. He began there in February 1757, just five months before their wedding in New Haven. When Sarah arrived into Northampton, there was no slipping in quietly. Based on the customs of the time, Elizabeth Dodds imagined Sarah's arrival in the Northampton church. Any beautiful newcomer in a small town was a curio, but when she was also the wife of the new minister, she caused intense interest. The rigid seating charts of churches at that time marked a minister's family as effectively as if a flag flew over the pew. So every eye in town was on Sarah as she swished in wearing her wedding dress. Custom demanded that a bride on her first Sunday in church wear her wedding dress and turn slowly so everyone could have a good look at it. (laughs) Pity the poor pastor trying to keep people's attention. Brides also had the privilege of choosing the text for the first Sunday after their wedding. There's no record of the text Sarah chose, but her favorite verse was, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ, from Romans 8. And it's possible she chose to hear that. She took her place in the seat that was to symbolize her role, a high bench facing the congregation, where everyone could notice the least flicker of expression, Sarah had been prepared for this exposed position every family of her childhood. In other words, the whole pastor's family sits in that bench facing as she grew up in New Haven. But it was different to be herself the minister's wife. Other women could yawn or furtively twitch a numbed foot in the cold of a January morning in an unheated building. Never she. George Marsden says, by the fall of 1927, now remember they were married in July, Jonathan had dramatically recovered his spiritual bearings, specifically his ability to find the spiritual intensity that he had lost for three years. Perhaps a large part of that was that being in a church was more fitted to who he was than being in an academic setting. Perhaps. But we have to imagine and guess that a large part of the change in him was the married life that he had now with Sarah. He'd found his earthly home and haven And as Sarah stepped into this role of wife, she freed him to pursue the philosophical and scientific and theological wrestlings that made him the man that we honor. Edwards was a man that people reacted to. He was different. He was intense. He was his moral force was a threat to people who just didn't much care one way or the other. So after he thought through the biblical truth and implications of an issue, he wouldn't back down from what he discovered. For instance, as we heard this morning, he came to realize that only believers should be taking communion in the church. This was hard on the people in the church who had gotten used to the standards of his grandfather, who had allowed communion even for non-believers as long as they weren't participating in obvious sin. This kind of controversy meant that Sarah in the background, was subjected to the same kind of bumps and twists in life that he was as controversies went on. He was a thinker who held ideas in his mind, mulling them over, taking them apart, putting them back together again, combining them with truth from other things that he'd been thinking about, trying to find God's truth. 
trying to see it. Such a man reaches great heights when the pieces come together right and great lows when it's a hard time getting there. This is not an easy kind of man to live with. And that may have been part of what made Sarah slow to accept his courtship from the beginning. But now they're married. She finds ways to make a happy home for him. She made him sure of her steady love. And then she made an environment and a routine where he was free to work. She learned that when he was caught up in a thought, he didn't want to be interrupted for dinner. She learned that his moods were intense. He wrote in his journal, I have had very affecting views of my own sinfulness and vileness very frequently to such a degree as to hold me in a kind of loud weeping so that I've often been forced to shut myself up. The town mostly saw a composed man, but Sarah knew Jonathan at home. Samuel Hopkins, a friend who knew them later, wrote, while she uniformly paid a becoming deference to her husband and treated him with entire respect, she spared no pains in conforming to his inclination and rendering everything in the family agreeable and pleasant, accounting it her greatest glory and there wherein she could best serve God and her generation, and we'll add our generation, to be the means in this way of promoting his youthful, usefulness and happiness. So life in the Edwards house was shaped in large degree by Jonathan's calling. One of his journal entries had said, I think that Christ has commended rising early in the morning by his rising from the grave very early. So it was Jonathan's habit to wake early, and that was the habit then of the whole family, to wake early, hear a chapter from the Bible by candlelight, and to pray for God's blessing on the day ahead. It was his habit to do some kind of physical work during each day for exercise, chopping wood, mending fences, working in the garden. But Sarah had most of the responsibility for the overseeing the care of the property. He was usually in his study for 13 hours a day. This included lots of hours of preparations for Sundays and for Bible teaching. It doesn't count the days, the weeks that he was traveling. But it, and it also, those hours include the times when Sarah came in to visit and talk and when parishioners stopped by for prayer or counsel. In the evening, Sarah and Jonathan would often ride into the woods together on their horses for exercise and to talk. And in the evening, they prayed again together. Beginning on August 25th, 1728, children came into their family, 11 in all, at about two-year intervals. Sarah, Jerusha, Esther, Mary, Lucy, Timothy, Susanna, Eunice, Jonathan, Elizabeth, and Pierpont. This was the beginning of Sarah's next great role, that of mother. In 1900, A.E. Winship made a study of two families. One of them had been a drain on society. The other, in contrast, was the Edwards family. Uh, he wrote, whatever the family has done, it has done ably and nobly, and much of the capacity and talent, intelligence and character of the more than 1,400 of the Edwards family, this is 1900, much of those good qualities is due to Mrs. Edwards. By 1900, when Winship made his study, from the Edwards had come 13 college presidents, 65 professors, 100 lawyers, 30 judges, 66 physicians, and 80 holders of public office. They'd written 135 books, edited 18 journals, and as he put it, they had entered the ministry in platoons and sent 100 missionaries overseas, as well as stocking many mission boards with lay trustees. And so we might well ask with Elizabeth Dodds, has any other mother contributed more vitally to the leadership of a nation? Six of the Edwards children were born on Sunday, but it was commonly believed by at least some people during that time that a child was born on the day of the week on which it was conceived and therefore there were some pastors who wouldn't baptize the baby who was born on Sunday. <laughs> Apparently that wasn't an appropriate Sabbath activity. But I hold that the Edwards prove that Sunday afternoon naps are an old tradition. <laughs> All of the Edwards children lived into adolescence, at least. It was an that was an amazing thing at a time when death was always very close. 
and the freedom of their family from this kind of tragedy did cause resentment among other families at times. In our centrally heated houses, it's difficult to imagine the tasks that were Sarah's to do or to delegate, breaking ice to haul water, bringing in firewood and tending the fire, cooking and packing lunches for visiting travelers, making the family's clothing, all the way from the sheep shearing and through the spinning and the weaving actually to the sewing, growing and preserving produce, making brooms, doing laundry, tending babies and nursing illnesses, making candles, feeding poultry and produce, overseeing butchering, teaching the boys whatever they didn't learn at school, and seeing that the girls learned homemaking creativity. That's just a fraction of what she was responsible for. How could she have known the gift that she was giving us as she freed Jonathan in these ways to fulfill his calling? Once Jonathan got a little taste of that when she was out of town and he was in charge and he wrote almost desperately, we've been without you almost as long as we know how to be. A lot of what we know about the workings of the Edwards family comes from Samuel Hopkins, who lived with them for a while. He wrote, she had an excellent way of governing her children. She knew how to make them regard and obey her cheerfully without loud, loud, angry words, much less heavy blows. If any correction was necessary, she did not administer it in a passion. And when she had occasion to reprove and rebuke, she would do it in few words without warmth and noise. Her system of discipline was begun at a very early age, he continues, and it was her rule to resist the first as well as every subsequent exhibition of temper or disobedience in the child, wisely reflecting that until a child will obey his parents, he can never be brought to obey God. Their children were 11 different people, proving that I believe that Sarah's discipline didn't squash their personalities, Perhaps because an important part of their disciplined life was, as Samuel Hopkins wrote, for her children, she constantly and earnestly prayed and bore them on her heart before God, and that even before they were born. Sarah knew that every day that Jonathan was home, he would give an hour to the children. Hopkins describes Jonathan's entering freely into the feelings and concerns of his children and relaxing into cheerful and animate conversation, accompanied frequently with sprightly remarks and sallies of wit and humor. And then he went back to his study for more work before dinner. This was a different man than the parish usually saw. And often, as the children grew old enough, when Edwards traveled, he would take one or another of the children with him. It's possible to piece together a lot of details about the Edwards household because they were paper savers. Paper was expensive and it had to be ordered from Boston. And so they saved all the old bills and shopping lists and first drafts of letters. And then those are the pages that Jonathan stitched together to make the small books that he wrote his sermons in. So the sermons are the treasure on one side. The household history is the treasure on the other side of those pages. Everyday details, like, for instance, shopping lists that ask him when he goes to Boston to bring back chocolate. (laughs) It was understood by travelers in the colonial time that if there was no inn in a town or if it was not a very nice place, the Parsons house would be a welcoming place to stay. So from the beginning in Northampton, Sarah exercised her gifts of hospitality. Their home was well known and busy and praised. Sarah wasn't then only mother and wife and hostess. This was not a perfunctory thing. She felt spiritual responsibility for the people who came into her house. A long line of young apprentice pastors showed up on their doorsteps over the years, hoping to live with them and soak up experiences from Jonathan. That's why Samuel Hopkins, who I've mentioned before, was living with them and how he had the occasion to observe their family He arrived at the Edwards home in December 1741, and here's what he wrote about the welcome that he received. When I arrived there, Mr. Edwards was not at home, but I was received with great kindness by Mrs. Edwards and the family and had encouragement that I might live there during the winter. I was very gloomy and was most of the time retired in my chamber. After some days, Mrs. Edwards came and said, as I was now become a member of the family for a season, she felt herself interested in my welfare. And as she observed that I appeared gloomy and dejected, she hoped I would not think she intruded her desiring to know and asking me what was the occasion of it. I told her I was in a Christless, graceless state. 
upon which we entered into a free conversation, and she told me that she had prayed respecting me since I had been in the family, that she trusted I should receive light and comfort, and doubted not that God intended yet to do great things by me. Sarah had seven children at that time, ages 13 down to one and a half, and yet she also took this young man under her wing and encouraged him, and he remembered it all his life. The impact of Sarah's assurance of God's working in his life didn't stop with that personal conversation. Hopkins went on to become a pastor in Newport, Rhode Island, a town that was heavily dependent on the slave economy. And he raised a strong voice against it, which, as you can imagine, was not popular to many people around him. But there was one young man who heard his words and was impressed. That was William Ellery Channing, who at, up until that point in his life didn't know what direction his life would take. He had long talks with Hopkins, went back to Boston, and became a pastor who influenced Emerson and Thoreau, and he had a large, large part in the abolitionist movement. We all have conversations that are forgotten, and this conversation, too, would have been forgotten, except that Hopkins wrote it down. And our conversations go into chains, and, you know, we don't usually see the way God winds the chains of our conversation through lives. We just happen to have had a piece, a few of the links in this one pictured, and we don't know where it went from there, but God does. And I just want to encourage you with the forgotten conversations that you have, that God is working. Samuel Hopkins admired Sarah. He wrote that she made it her rule to speak well of all so far as she could with truth and justice to herself and others. That sounds a lot like what Jonathan had written in the front of his Greek book. And, and I take that as confirmation that when Jonathan was writing about her as a, a lovesick young man, he wasn't blinded by love. He was seeing what was really there in her life. When, I, when Hopkins watched the relationship between Jonathan and Sarah, he saw that in the midst of these complicated labors, Edwards found at home one who was in every sense a helpmate for him, one who made their common dwelling the abode of order and neatness, of peace and comfort, of harmony and love to all its inmates, and of kindness and hospitality to the friend, the visitant, and the stranger. Another person who observed the Edwards family was George Whitfield. When he visited America during the Great Awakening, he came to Northampton for a weekend in October 1740, and he preached four times. On Saturday morning, he spoke to the Edwards children in their home, Whitfield wrote that when he preached on Sunday morning, Jonathan Edwards wept during almost the whole service. The Edwards had a great effect on Whitfield as well. He, he wrote, felt wonderful satisfaction in being at the house of Mr. Edwards. He is a son himself and hath also a daughter of Abraham for his wife. A sweeter couple I have not yet seen. Their children were dressed not in silks and satins, but plain, as becomes the children of those who in all things ought to be examples of Christian simplicity. She is a woman adorned with a meek and quiet spirit, taught feelingly and solidly of the things of God, and seemed to be such a help meet for her husband that she caused me to renew those prayers for which, which for many months I have put up to God, that he would be pleased to send me a daughter of Abraham to be my wife. The next year, Whitfield did indeed marry a widow who some say was perhaps not the best wife, that it might not have been an entirely happy match, but John Wesley does describe, did describe her as a woman of candor and humanity. The second phase of the awakening crested in the spring and summer of 1741. Things were happening at home that seemed mundane, but they were shaping what was happening in their family. That was the same time that Jonathan was asking the church for a set salary because of his growing family and their financial needs. This caused the parish to watch very closely the lifestyle of the Edwards, and then the church council uh, decided that Sarah should keep an exact account of all of the expenditures of the family. At about that time, in January 1742, we come to an event in Sarah's life that was a turning point for her. And this is a good time to think about what a difficult task biographers have trying to record fairly a person's life and, for us, how hard it is to evaluate what it is we read in biography. 
An obvious problem arises when a biographer's worldview makes him blind to important aspects in a person's life. Ian Murray uh, talks about this problem when he looks at two prominent Edwards biographers and says uh, Ola Winslow rejected Jonathan Edwards' theology, and then later in Perry Miller, anti-supernatural animus hate comes to its fullest expression. It seems amazing to me that somebody could write a, a well-received biography of Edwards that lauds his philosophy but rejects his God and anything supernatural. And then as a reader, what if that's all that you had to read about Edwards? That's all you knew about him. That's the challenge for us as biography readers, trying to find and recognize a well-balanced approach when we're reading. Okay, so in January of, of 1742, Sarah went through a crisis that different biographers come at from very different directions. Ola Winslow, who rejected Edwards' theology, used this spiritual experience of Sarah's. We look at it as a spiritual experience. I'm going to get to that. But she used Sarah's experience to minimize Jonathan's acceptance of the outward active manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Winslow wrote, the fact that his wife was given to these more extreme manifestations no doubt inclined him to a more hospitable attitude toward them. In other words, she seems to be assuming that under nor or normal circumstances he would have rejected such activities of enthusiasm, but since his wife had acted that way, he had to treat them more kindly. Perry Miller, who rejected the idea of anything supernatural, just concluded that Sarah's story gave Jonathan a good proof case against the people who uh, thought that spiritual enthusiasm was from Satan. So in other words, his implication seemed to be, we modern people know that such manifestations couldn't really be supernatural. Edward was old-fashioned, and he thought there was something supernatural going on, but it was really convenient anyway for him to have what happened to his wife so that he could say to people, see, this happened to my wife, so it has to be something real. Dodds, who has written an otherwise good book, I think is off base here. She describes Sarah as limply needful, grotesque, jabbering, hallucinating, idiotically fainting. She calls it a breaking point and attributes it to her previous stoicism, having to deal with so many children, a husband who's hard to take care of, financial stress, an occasion when Jonathan had criticized her for the way she spoke to someone, one of that Williams clan who was always bugging them. And, uh, and to her jealousy over the success of a pastor who was visiting, a preacher who was visiting while Jonathan was away. And Dodd says we can't know if it was a religious transport or a nervous breakdown. And you can tell as she writes, she's inclining toward the nervous breakdown. Now, over against all of those people, Sarah's account, as written down by Jonathan, speaks of it unambiguously as a spiritual encounter. What really happened? I think the best we can do is to hear Sarah's own words as Jonathan wrote them down. He published her account in some thoughts concerning the present revival of religion. For privacy's sake, he didn't use her name or even reveal what her gender was. He speaks about the person. So he, he, he wrote, uh, following what she said to him, The soul dwelt on high and was lost in God and seemed almost to leave the body dwelling in a pure delight that fed and satisfied the soul. There were extraordinary views of divine things and religious affections being frequently attended with very great effects on the body, nature often sinking under the weight of divine discoveries, the strength of the body taken away so as to deprive of all ability to stand or speak, sometimes the hands clenched and the flesh cold, but senses remaining, animal nature often in a great emotion and agitation and the soul very often of late, so overcome with great admiration and a kind of omnipotent joy as to cause the person wholly unavoidably to leap with all the might, with joy and mighty exaltation of soul. The flesh and heart seems often to cry out for a lying low before God and adoring him with greater love and humility. 
the thoughts of the perfect humility with which the saints in heaven worship God and fall down before his throne have often overcome the body and set it into a great agitation. There's lots more. But you're subject here to my choice of what I'm going to give you. But you can go read it yourself in some thoughts concerning the present revival of religion. So was it psychological or spiritual? None of us ever has events in our lives that are totally motivated or caused or intended by pure spiritual motives. And there's no doubt that Jonathan and Sarah saw that she had been affected by the physical things that were happening in her life, but they also saw that her experiences were from God and for her good, for her spiritual delight and benefit. They proved to us to be people who we can trust the spiritual judgment of. And so I'm inclined to trust their judgment here that this was primarily a spiritual event and not just a breakdown because of the circumstances of life. All those things really were in Sarah's life, financial stress, family stress. But we know, all of us, we've seen it in our own lives, that God builds on what's already happening in our lives to show us how we need him and to show us himself in those times. A couple of reasons why I think she was experiencing God and not just psychological stress or breakdown. I don't know anybody. This is just straight from my own experience. I don't know anybody who's had a physical nervous breakdown and then just snapped back as if nothing had ever happened. Um, and I'll, and I just had to put in a little parenthesis here. Dodds does suggest that when Sarah sat down and explained, Jonathan was away from home almost this entire time. So when they sat down together and she explained to him what had happened and he wrote it down, Dodds suggests that um, Jonathan Edwards was anticipating the discovery of psychotherapy. So I, didn't, I bet you didn't know we had him to thank for that. A second reason that I put stock in this being a spiritual event is that Jesus said, by their fruits you shall know them. Her life was different after these weeks, and it was different in the ways that you would expect when someone has been touched by God. Jonathan said she had experienced not only a great increase of religious affections, but also a wonderful alteration of outward behavior in many things visible to those who are most intimately acquainted, so as lately to have become, as it were, a new person. I, I, my ear was caught immediately this morning as we sang the hymn, Jesus, I am resting, resting, where it says, Thou hast bid me gaze upon thee, and thy beauty fills my soul. For by thy transforming power thou hast made me whole. I thought I was hearing Sarah's experience there. Jonathan also assured the reader that she hadn't become too heavenly minded to be any earthly good. He quotes her as saying, oh, how good it is to work for God in the daytime and at night to lie down under his smiles. High experiences and religious affections in this person have not been attended with any disposition at all to neglect the necessary business of a secular calling. But worldly business has been attended with great alacrity as part of the service of God. The person declaring that it being done thus, tis found to be as good as prayer. And here it was in the hymn again this morning. Ever lift thy face upon me as I work and wait for thee. Resting neath thy smile, Lord Jesus, earth's dark shadows flee. This hymn was written by a woman who was born a hundred years after this event in Sarah's life, but it almost seems to be describing what Sarah experienced. Sarah's changed life for the fingerprint of God, not of psychological imbalance. Jonathan said, if such things are enthusiasm and the fruits are of a distempered brain, let my brain be ever more possessed of that happy distemper. <laughs> if this be distraction, I pray, God, that the world of mankind may be all seized with this benign, meek, beneficent, beatifical, glorious distraction. Now, and we mustn't imagine during these weeks that she was shut away from everyone. She was carrying on her normal household duties. Jonathan was away from home all except two of those days. So she was responsible for the seven children, for the guests, for attending special meetings when they were visiting preachers at the church. Probably no one at the time grasped 
what was happening between her and God and how he was shaking and shaping her then. And this was only a month after Samuel Hopkins had moved into their home. So as he's describing what Sarah's like, some of it is encompassing this time. After more than 20 years, Jonathan was voted out of his church in Northampton. I'm not going to dwell on that part of the story because it's a fairly well-known part of their life. But it would be worth a minute of our time to empathize with the emotional and financial stress it would have been for Sarah. First of all, that her husband was rejected, and therefore she and her children as well. And until they could find another position, they lived in Northampton for another year. And somehow they managed without a salary to support their family. In Stockbridge, there was a community of Indians and a few whites, and they were urgently searching for a pastor at the same time that Jonathan was looking for God's next step in his life. So in 1750, the Edwards moved to Stockbridge out on the western side of Massachusetts on the pioneer edge of that British finger hold on the eastern edge of the continent. In 1871, 120 years after this, Harper's New Monthly Magazine ran an article called A New England Village featuring Stockbridge, and they include in it an account of the Northampton controversy, which will give us at least a popular view of the effect of that controversy over who should be allowed to take communion, and of the esteem that Edwards was held in even 120 years after his death, by some people at least. There succeeded to that vacant office in the wild woods, one whose name is not only highly honored throughout this land, but better known and more honored abroad, perhaps, than that of any of our countrymen except Washington. As a preacher, a philosopher, and a person of devoted piety, he is unsurpassed. But after a most successful ministry of more than 20 years, a controversy had arisen between him and his people, and they had thrust him out from them rudely and almost in disgrace. The subsequent adoption of his views, not only in Northampton, but throughout the churches of New England, has abundantly vindicated his position in that lamentable controversy. He was not too great in his own estimation to accept the place now offered him. And then they describe Edwards as almost a thinking machine in this article, that a man thus thoughtful should yet be indifferent to many things of practical importance would not be strange. So this is how he's remembered 120 years later. Accordingly, we are told that the care of his domestic and secular affairs was devolved almost entirely upon his wife, who happily, while of kindred spirit with him in many respects, and fitted to be his companion, was also capable of assuming the cares which were thus laid upon him, upon her. And then they go on to talk of his absent mindedness and not remembering people as he passes them on the street and then passes them again 10 minutes later because he's thinking. The Edwards family had hardly tasted death. They hadn't been untouched, but compared to people around them, they were very aware of death's constant nearness. How easily a woman could die in childbirth, how easily a child could die of fever. How easily one might be struck by a shot or arrow of war. How easily might a fireplace spark a house fire with all the sleep in it lost. When Jonathan wrote to his children, he often reminded them, not morbidly, but almost as a matter of fact, how close death might be. For Jonathan, then, the fact of death led automatically to the thought of the need for eternal life. He wrote to their 10-year-old son, Jonathan, Jr., about the death of a playmate. This is a loud call of God to you to prepare for death. Never give yourself any rest unless you have good evidence that you are converted and become a new creature. I think we can safely say that would have been Sarah's concern for her children as well. But Jonathan was the one who's, who was writing more frequently. We do move into the tragic part of their life now from a human perspective. A family tragedy was the opening page of the final chapter of their lives. 
Their daughter, Esther, was the wife of Aaron Burr, who was the president of the College of New Jersey, which later would become Princeton. On September 24, 1757, this son-in-law of Jonathan and Sarah died suddenly, leaving Esther and two small children. This would be the first of five family deaths in a year. Aaron Burr's death left the presidency open at the College of New Jersey, and Edwards was invited. It was a very difficult choice for him because he had felt that God had given him grace and time and freedom for writing and thinking in Stockbridge that he knew he wouldn't have. But in January 1758, he set out for Princeton, expecting his family to join him in the spring. George Marsden pictures that moment. He left Sarah and his children in Stockbridge, as 17-year-old Susanna later reported, as affectionately as if he should not come again. When he was outside the house, he turned and declared, I commit you to God. He had hardly moved into the president's house in Princeton when he received the news that his father had died. His father had been a huge influence in his life in the past, although... As Marston says, a great force in his life was finally gone, though the power of the personality had faded some years earlier. But there's his father gone now at the beginning of this year. In, during this final chapter of Jonathan and Sarah's lives, there are intense moments that symbolize and confirm God's work through the life of Sarah Edwards in ways that highlight some of the key roles she was given by God. For instance, her role as a mother with the desire to raise godly children. When Aaron Burr died, we catch a glimpse of how well Sarah had prepared her daughter, Esther, for unexpected tragedy. Esther wrote to her mother two weeks after, her husband's, after Esther's husband's death, God has seemed sensibly near in such a supporting and comfortable manner that I think I've never experienced the like. I doubt not, but I have your and my honored father's prayers daily for me. But give me leave to entreat you to request earnestly of the Lord that I may never faint under this his severe stroke. I am afraid I shall conduct myself so as to bring dishonor on the religion which I profess. At the darkest moment of her life, she is fervently desiring not to dishonor God. Then the moments that highlight Sarah's role as the wife of Jonathan. Soon after Jonathan arrived at Princeton, he was inoculated for smallpox. This was still an experimental procedure, but he was a very scientifically oriented person, and he wanted to be trying something that looked like it was going to be a good idea. On March 22, 1758, however, he died. While Sarah was still back in Stockbridge packing the family to, for their move to Princeton, this was less than three months after he'd said goodbye at their doorstep. During the last minutes of his life, he whispered to his daughter there beside him, Give my kindest love to my dear wife and tell her that the uncommon union which has so long subsisted between us has been of such a nature as I trust is spiritual and therefore will continue forever. His last word and thoughts were for his beloved wife, Sarah. A week and a half later, Sarah wrote, wrote to Esther. Now it's been six months since Esther's husband had died. And Sarah writes, My very dear child, what shall I say? A holy and good God has covered us with a dark cloud. Oh, that we may kiss the rod and lay our hands upon our mouths. The Lord has done it. He has made me adore his goodness that we had him so long. But my God lives and he has my heart. Oh, what a legacy my husband and your father has left us. We are given to God, and there I am and love to be, your affectionate mother. Esther, however, never read her mother's letter. On April 17, less than two weeks after her father's death, Esther died. Perhaps of the smallpox vaccination, although it seemed that she had recovered from that, perhaps it was fever that came unexpectedly and killed so many. Esther died, leaving two children. Sarah traveled to Princeton to stay with those grandchildren and then to take them back to Stockbridge with her. And then here's a snapshot 
highlighting her most important role, her role as a child of God. In October, she was traveling towards Stockbridge with little Sally and young Aaron Jr., Esther's children. And while stopping at the home of friends, Sarah was overcome with dysentery and her life on earth ended on October 2nd, 1758. She was 49 years old. The people with her reported that when she apprehended her death was near, she expressed her entire resignation to God and her desire that he might be glorified in all things and that she might be enabled to glorify him to the last and continued in such a temper, calm and resigned, till she died. Hers was the fifth Edwards death in a year and the fourth Edwards family grave in the Princeton Cemetery during that year. Here is her life in a list. Not a sufficient way to name a life, but just to remind us. She was the supporter and protector and home builder for Jonathan Edwards, whose philosophy and passion for God is vital still 300 years after his birth. She was the godly mother and example to 11 children who became the parents of outstanding citizens of this country and immensely important, much more important to her, many are also citizens of heaven. She was the hostess and comforter and encourager of Samuel Hopkins and who knows how many others who went on to minister to others, who went on to minister to others, and it goes on. She was an example to George Whitfield and who knows how many others of a godly wife. And finally, and most important, she was a child of God who from early years experienced sweet spiritual communion with him, who over the years grew in grace and who at least once and probably more was dramatically transformed by God visiting her in a way that she remembered the rest of her life and that changed the rest of her life. Now, I would like to give you a chance to add something that I've forgotten, ask questions, make corrections, and speak loudly, but I'll also repeat what you say. Yes. Do I know if he discussed any of his sermons with her at all? I don't know that he did in a formal way, but I expect that as they were riding or walking in the evenings, he was talking about his ideas with her as they were shaping up some. Yes. Yes. What has most impacted me from Sarah's life? You know, each time I go back and read her life or look over it, there is something new, and it, that would be shaped somewhat by what's happening in my life now. Um, the thing that I was struck with now, I didn't really talk a whole lot about. Uh, um, I read again that Psalm 131 was one of her favorite passages of Scripture. And in relation to the idea of submission, being submitted to God, and what, that was a very important Puritan quality that people sought, not just women, but women seemed to perhaps be better at it. I don't know. But um, in the context of that uh, transforming time in January of 1942, uh, 1742, Coming to feel herself more submitted to God was a very important part of it. And this was another thing I saw in this hymn, hymn here. Um, Jesus, I am resting, resting. Let me read you a couple of verses from Psalm 131. O Lord, my heart is not proud, nor my eyes haughty, nor do I involve myself in great things or in matters too difficult for me. Then this is the verse. Surely I have composed and quieted my soul. Like a weaned child rests against his mother, my soul is like a weaned child within me. Speaking of herself as being weaned from the things that keep her from God or being weaned in a way that causes her to be more submitted to God, that was a, a word that she used a lot. 
I read. And I pictured that verse, what does it mean to be a, a weaned child? Uh, a child who is not yet weaned is always going after its mother. It can't just lean and rest against his mother. To come to that stage where you don't, where you're not going after what God can give you, you're just enjoying resting on God himself. That's what I saw again this time. Yes. How about that question, but in relation to your um, your views on how you relate to your husband? What aspect of Sarah's life do you feel is most impacted you in the way that you do relate to your husband? What what aspect of Sarah's life most um, do I connect with most, or most impact me about uh, supporting my husband or being my husband's wife? Um, well, the most convicting thing is reading what Samuel Hopkins says about having a neat and orderly home. <laughs> Sorry, Johnny. <laughs> I, I do, I do really appreciate her pattern, her life, her sense of calling to provide the base, the home base from which children are raised in a godly way and sent out and which a husband can come home to after his travels, after his preaching, to be a quiet, peaceful place, whatever controversies are going on around. Yes. Who raised her children after she passed away? Um, I'm not remembering in great detail, but some of her children were old enough to take some of the other children under their wings. So that was that was the beginning. Do you do you know more, Ian? Her, the, older the older children. Many of her children are buried at Stockbridge. They lived there still after she died. Yes. In the black sweater. Yeah. What do I know of the relationship between Jerusha and David Brainerd? David Brainerd, as we heard this morning, came ill to their house and died after a short time with tuberculosis. Jerusha, their daughter, who was in her teens at the time, was played a large part in nursing him and actually traveled with him to perhaps to get medical treatment or for something, I forget exactly what, which I think was probably somewhat shocking that they would let her do that. So I don't know that anything is actually written that says for sure that they were in love with each other, but there does seem to have been a closeness. She died not long after he did. And what I can tell you about Jerusha is that she was named for Jonathan's sister Jerusha, who also died young and was perhaps the favorite of his siblings to him, and the most, certainly the most pious as far as we know. And um, I think it was Marsden who said there is no namesake who so closely lived up to, I mean, so, no child who so closely lived to its namesake as Jerusha, the daughter, did to Jerusha, the sister. So she was a very, she was perhaps the most closely spiritually attuned of Jonathan and Sarah's children. So someone like David Brainerd would certainly have, and his intense spirituality and connection with God would certainly have drawn her. Yes. Are there people here in the celebration from the Edwards Are there any people here at this Edwards conference who are part of the Edwards lineage? We don't. I don't know. Is there anyone in this room? <laughs> Someone who possibly is. Okay. Yes. You mentioned that uh, she was affected by the rejection of her husband, uh, by the people of North Hampton. North Hampton. Uh, did she handle that in a godly way, and how has that helped you in the support of your husband? Did she, when Jonathan was rejected by the people of North Hampton, did she handle that in a godly way? How has that affected me? I don't know how she handled it. 
I know it was a very awkward time. The church even had him do supply preaching during that year when they didn't have somebody else to preach some Sundays. Um, they took away from him the acres of land that had been allotted to the family as part of their part of their income was this land that they could work themselves to raise food. They took it away from them during that year. Um, so life was not easy, and, but I don't know how she responded to that. And so, therefore, that particular year is not a good example to me. And I'm not really aware, or it's not coming to my mind, I should say right now, how she dealt with rejection specifically. We can just know that what he was, what was affecting him outside the home would be coming home in some way to, uh, for her to feel it as well. Yes. Biblically and practically, was that the other question, part of it? Should we expect more of the pastor's wife than any other con- of any other congregant's wife? Um, yes and no. And the yes part is that the pastor's wife usually is a more visible person than other people. And so that means that it matters more what's in her life. And... The no part is that we are all equally responsible to God for our actions and what's um, what sin is sin, whether it's in the pastor's wife or in someone else as as God sees it. Yes. Yes. Purple shirt. What do we know about the children's response uh, and reaction to their father's profession? I wish I had a couple of quotes in front of me, which I can't bring to mind exactly. But um, there are a couple of very um, fond notes where, for instance, Esther would refer to her father as she's writing to someone else. In, in a complimentary, respectful, appreciative terms. I don't think we know how they responded to his being a pastor. Do you know anything more about that, Ian? Very little. Come, come take the microphone here so people can hear you. Thank you, Norella. I thought it was wonderful. I wouldn't have missed this afternoon for anything. I was, I almost had to buy a seat to get in here. Uh, but uh, I was just going to mention, on one occasion, uh, you know this well, but there's so much to say, isn't there? But Edwards was preaching, or should have been preaching, at a place called Portsmouth. It was an ordination service. And by the time the service was to begin, Edwards hadn't come. So there was a bit of... Uh, concern and eventually Reverend Samuel Moody said that he would take the service. So Moody begins the service, they they sing the psalms, they have the long prayer and uh, uh, as Moody is praying in the long prayer um, he gave thanks to Mr. Edwards' ministry for his eminent piety, his disappointment that he couldn't be there today, imagine he was lost somewhere on the trail you know. And then, to his great consternation, when he said amen and opened his eyes, Edwards was standing beside him in the pulpit. (laughs) He had come in quietly. And this, you know, a Puritan pastor doesn't talk like that. And he he says, God knows, Mr. Edwards, I didn't mean to flatter you to your face. (laughs) And, And then he thought he should say something just to bring Edwards perhaps down a little. And he said... They do say that your wife has found a shorter way to heaven. (laughs) And I think we know that story because of his daughter, Mary, who apparently had a sense of humor. Yes. Uh, 
What was it about the Puritan mindset that had the pastor's family sit at the front? I can only guess, but my best guess would be that they did expect the pastor's family to be an example to the rest of the church. And there are churches, you know, perhaps still now, I don't know, but not too long past, where all of the elders or deacons of the church would sit facing the church, too, from the front as the pastor preached. So, I, and I guess that would be for the same reason. The people who, in some sense, are leaders, those would be more official leaders. The family would be more, um, by example, leaders. Yes. Should there be um, aspects of the Puritan pastor's wife that should be brought back more into the pastor's wife life now? Um, I, I, the first thing that comes to mind is that I feel concerned when I hear wives who feel like um, their own calling is not intimately enough tied together with their own husband's as if they have separate, even separate ministries, rather than a life that together is ministering in some way. I'm very encouraged by the um, setting now. That, well, well let, me just, let me just use an example. The staff of our church, there are, I forget how many pastors and that many pastors' wives. And as, I, as we pastors' wives are together, I look around the circle and I see so many different gifts that God has given us. We are all such different people and uh, varying. Uh, I mean, one woman sings beautifully. Another woman ha- uh, invites people over at the drop of a hat. Um, some would rather be quiet in the background. Some do things more publicly. God uses all of those gifts. And I just, that's, that's the main thing that I would like to see is that that pastors' wives are not feeling like they have to be in a certain kind of mold, but that they are sensitively looking to God for how he wants to use the gifts that he's given them for some purpose in ministry with their husbands alongside and together. Okay, I think one more question. That's not an easy one to end with. What response, what, what advice do I have to young pastors' wives now who are overwhelmed with the responsibilities at home? My encouragement would be that there are different pages in the story of our life, and on one page we may just feel like we're not quite going to make it till we turn to the next page, and then the next page, which might be day off, which might be next month, something within sight, uh, things let up a little bit. There are also different chapters in life. And in some chapters, perhaps it's when there are small children, you may not be as free for big dinner kinds of entertaining, say. Um, but God will show you. And it might just be you have the kind of time right now for two minutes on the telephone to pray with somebody. God has some kind of ministry for you in the chapter that you're in right now and don't feel like you have to do every kind of ministry there is or that you even every kind of ministry that you love to do at every part of your life. Thank you for listening to this message from Desiring God, the ministry of John Piper, pastor for preaching at Bethlehem Baptist Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Feel free to make copies of this message for others, but please do not charge for those copies or alter the content in any way without permission. We invite you to visit Desiring God online at www.desiringgod.org, where you'll find hundreds of sermons, articles, radio broadcasts, and more, all available at no charge. Our online bookstore carries all of Pastor John's books, audio, and video resources, and you can also stay up to date on what's new at Desiring God. Again, our website is is 
dot desiring God dot org or call us toll free at one eight 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 three four six forty seven hundred. Our mailing address is Desiring God twenty six zero one East Franklin Avenue, Minneapolis, Minnesota five five four zero six. Desiring God exists to help you make God your treasure because God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him.